The nation's strategic deterrent is the foundation upon which all our defense efforts are built. We simply cannot allow it to weaken or to crack. And yet we've neglected it for some time while other nations have not only invested in their nuclear systems, but advanced their capability. Our strategic deterrent consists of the delivery systems, the three legs of the triad, and also the nuclear weapons themselves and the command and control over those systems. Our Minuteman III missiles were first fielded in 1970. Our B-52 and B-2 bombers were first deployed in the 1950s and the 1980s. Our ballistic missile submarines began entering service in 1981 and, like the other legs of the triad, have a limited lifespan. The warheads themselves were largely designed and built in the 1970s or before, and the last time a warhead was fully tested was 1991. And so, for some years, some of our most brilliant scientists and engineers have been working to keep these complex machines safe, secure, reliable, and credible without being able to test the entire weapon. They have done so in aging, neglected facilities with an aging workforce. Similarly, the command and control systems for our deterrent have not received the attention something so vital should have received. And meanwhile, our potential adversaries develop and field new delivery systems, and they develop and field new weapons. And confidence in the U.S. strategic deterrent erodes. I'm sure all of you have noticed the articles over the last few days which reported that Europe was considering developing their own nuclear deterrent if they can no longer count on ours. The same may well be true in Asia as well. Some say we cannot afford to update this part of our defenses, but depending on how one allocates the cost of the new bomber, operating, sustaining, and updating our strategic deterrent never requires more than 6 to 7 percent of our defense budget. As former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter and others have pointed out, this is affordable because it is our highest priority defense mission. Contemplating a world without a reliable strategic deterrent is a nightmare the modern world has never had to face, and I hope it never does. The committee has a number of events over the course of this week focusing on this topic of strategic deterrence. Today, we're grateful to have several of our top military leaders to help us consider what our strategic deterrent means for American national security. Now, it may well be that members have some policy questions which uh, uniformed military members are not able to answer. As you know, we do not yet have uh, uh, people in place in the new administration to answer some of those questions. But they are here to talk about the military implications of our strategic deterrent. This hearing and the committee's broader series on nuclear deterrence will remind us the American people, our allies, and potential adversaries that the U.S. strategic deterrent must always be credible and must always be ready. Before turning to our witnesses, I would yield to the ranking member for any comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this hearing, and I appreciate the focus on our uh, nuclear weapons deterrent um, for this week. I think it is incredibly important, and the Chairman is correct. It is, it is a series of aging systems that need to be replaced, um, and we need to think about what our long-term nuclear strategy is. Um, the concern that I have, we absolutely have to have a nuclear deterrent. Uh, because, unfortunately, there are other countries and hostile countries like Russia and North Korea uh, that have nuclear weapons. We have to have enough of a deterrent to make sure that they never use them because they know that it would lead to their own destruction because of the size of our deterrent. Um, my questions as we go forward is whether or not we need as many nuclear weapons as we've had to present that deterrent. I always point out that China has a very straightforward deterrent. They don't have anywhere near as many nuclear weapons as we do, but they've got to, as we go forward and try to figure out what the new nuclear deterrent needs to look like, we don't imagine that we have to have absolutely everything that we really look at. What is a credible deterrent force? 
Uh, we're coming down, but uh, at the peak here a year or so ago, we had, well, wasn't the peak, uh, but we had well over 5,000 nuclear warheads um, and, you know, plenty of delivery systems. Is there a way that we can do this in a more cost-effective manner? And I say that because while I agree with the chairman that we have to have a nuclear deterrent, no question about it, uh, we also have to have it fit within a budget uh, because we, also, we have a lot of other priorities. Uh, when you look at what President Trump has said he wants in terms of the size of the force, um, you know, the, the size of the Army, the size of the Marine Corps, the way we want to build out the Navy, uh, at a certain point, the numbers don't add up. So if there is a way to do this in a more cost-effective manner, I think that's something we should look at. I don't think we should simply say, well, it's important, so we're going to spend whatever it takes. I don't think we can afford that, and I don't think it's a credible deterrent. And I also want to make sure that our policy going forward continues to be just that, that it is a deterrent force against any other adversary using nuclear weapons, that we don't dive into some of the conversations that have happened um, in our um, military circles over the course of the last 30 years, that somehow we can use, quote, tactical nuclear weapons on a first-use basis. I think we should maintain our policy of not using them first and using them as a credible deterrent. And I worry that some of the discussions have moved us in that direction. Now, I am aware that Russia um, has changed its tone on that, and there is cause for worry about how they view the use of nuclear weapons. And that's the last point I'll make. Credible deterrent is not just about how many nuclear weapons you have, but it is also about maintaining an open dialogue uh, with as many of those adversaries as possible to make sure that they know about that credible deterrent, and that discourages them. This is not just a military issue. It's diplomatic as well um, to make sure that we keep open those channels so there are not misunderstandings about what our nuclear deterrent is and what we are prepared to do with it. We certainly don't want a country like Russia to start thinking that they can do a first use uh, nuclear weapon uh, uh, attack and get away with it. So with that, I look forward to uh, testimony and the questions, and I yield back. Let me welcome our distinguished witnesses today. We have the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Paul Selva. We have the Commander of U.S. Strategic Command, General John Hyten. Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Bill Moran, and Vice Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, General Stephen Wilson. Without objection, your full written statements will be made part of the record. Again, thank each of you for being here. General Selva, the floor is yours for any comments you'd like to make. Thank you, Chairman Thornberry and Ranking Member Smith and members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify on the continuing relevance of our U.S. nuclear forces for our national security the considerations that are influencing the size and shape of those forces, and the steps the joint force is taking to modernize and replace them. Given the gravity of these issues, I deeply appreciate the committee's interest, attention, and oversight. With the President's recently directed nuclear posture review to assess the existing nuclear policy, and through many details regarding U.S. nuclear capabilities and employment concepts, these are all highly sensitive. Although they are, I look forward to your questions in this public forum and my ability to answer them as appropriate. As you know, the fundamental role of U.S. nuclear forces is to deter nuclear use against the United States, its allies, and partners. Simply put, nuclear weapons pose the only existential threat to the United States, and there's no substitute for the prospect of a devastating nuclear response to deter that threat. Our nuclear forces play important roles as well to include reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation and contributing to the deterrence of large-scale conventional war. These are long-standing objectives that have served U.S. national interest, but our ability to achieve, to achieve them cannot be taken for granted. No one should doubt that our weapons, our delivery systems, the infrastructure that supports them, and the personnel who operate, monitor, and maintain them are prepared to respond to any contingency. Our current challenge, however, is to main this, maintain this high level of readiness and capability as long as the policy and strategy of this nation depends in part on nuclear weapons for its security. This hearing comes at a critical moment in meeting that challenge. For more than two decades, the Joint Force has implemented a U.S. policy that calls for the reduction of the role of nuclear weapons and forces and our strategies and plans to decrease the number and types of those nuclear forces in our inventory. Yet a number of nations, including potential nuclear adversaries, have not followed our example. 
They instead are increasing their reliance on nuclear weapons, improving their nuclear capabilities, and in some cases, expanding their nuclear arsenals. Our nuclear deterrent, as has already been stated, is nearing a crossroads. To date, we have preserved this deterrent by extending the lifespan of legacy nuclear forces and infrastructure, in many cases for decades beyond what was originally intended. But these systems will not remain viable forever. In fact, we are now at a point where we must concurrently recapitalize each component of our nuclear deterrent. The nuclear weapons themselves, the triad of strategic delivery platforms, the indications and warning systems that support our decision processes, the command and control networks that connect the President to our fielded forces, and our dual-capable tactical aircraft that can be equipped with non-strategic nuclear weapons. Our Joint Forces' ability to preserve these capabilities beyond their intended lifespan is indeed a technical achievement. However, nuclear modernization can no longer be deferred. Any disruption in the current program of record for future acquisition plans will introduce the risk, significant risk to our deterrent. As a result of previous delays and deferrals, all well considered, we are currently depending on just-in-time modernization and replacement of many of the components of our nuclear triad. The cost of these efforts is substantial. Even at their peak, however, they will still represent less than 1% of anticipated federal spending and approximately 6% of the defense budget. Moreover, there is no higher priority for the joint force than fielding all of the components of an effective nuclear deterrent, and we are emphasizing the nuclear mission over all other modern modernization programs when faced with that choice. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate accepting my written statement into the record, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General Hyden. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee. On behalf of the men and women of the United States Strategic Command, I'd like to echo the thanks of the Vice Chairman and express our appreciation for the committee's continued support for the nuclear mission. I look forward to build upon this relationship on our shared objective of protecting the nation. Our mission at United States Strategic Command is to employ tailored nuclear, space, cyberspace, global strike, joint electronic warfare, missile defense, and intelligence capabilities. We deter aggression, decisively respond if deterrence fails, assure allies, shape adversary behavior, defeat terror, and define the force of the future. Let there be no doubt we have a safe, secure, reliable nuclear enterprise today, and our nuclear forces are ready to meet any challenge. Nonetheless, much work is needed to make sure that this is the case as we look out into the coming decades. At STRATCOM, peace is our profession, and one of the ways it is achieved is through strategic deterrence. That mission has been the bedrock of our national security for decades now, and it is foundational. As such, I have three priorities in my command. My number one priority is to provide that strategic deterrence against any potential adversary. Our operations are ceaseless, deliberate, and enabled by a commitment uh, to execute and modernize our C2 and nuclear enterprise, which will enable us to meet the demands of the current and future strategic environment. My second priority is to account for a deterrence failure in which this nation will count on us for a decisive response. That response must defeat any adversary with our nuclear, space, cyberspace, missile defense, and other strategic capabilities. Neither strategic deterrence nor decisive response will function, however, without a resilient, equipped, trained, and combat-ready force which is my final priority. Our fight is continuous each and every day across and around the globe. This requires our forces to have depth and capability and breadth and capacity. We cannot do it alone. We must constantly challenge ourselves to integrate with allies, partners, the interagencies, the department, the joint staff, and other commands to ensure we capitalize on the unique capabilities that STRATCOM can bring to bear. Today's deterrent or force remains safe, secure, reliable, and ready. However, the United States faces significant future challenges in sustaining the required capabilities to meet our enduring national security objectives and the extended deterrence commitments we have around the world. At a time when others continue to modernize and upgrade their nuclear forces, nearly all elements of the nuclear weapons stockpile, our delivery systems, our other critical infrastructure are operating well beyond their design service life. Maintaining strategic deterrence, assurance, and escalation control capabilities requires a multifaceted, long-term investment approach and a sustained commitment to maintain a credible nuclear deterrent. That nuclear deterrent is only as effective as the command and control that enables it to function. 
Therefore, our Nuclear Command and Control Communication Systems, NC3, must be assured, reliable, and resilient across the full spectrum of conflict. Maintaining a credible deterrent requires sustainment and modernizations of key systems and capabilities throughout the architecture. The unpredictable challenges posed by today's multi-domain, multi-threat security environment make it increasingly important to optimize, or optimize our legacy NC3 systems and leverage new technologies and capabilities. Through continuing funding for NC3 modernization, we can uh, ensure effective command and control for these forces well into the future. So I look forward to participating in the, in the hearing today in the administration's uh, recently announced nuclear posture review, which will address many of the issues we'll discuss. And I thank the committee again for your support. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Admiral Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning, and I echo the comments by both General Selva and General Hyten. And I'm extremely proud to represent the men and women who man, operate, and maintain our strategic uh, ballistic submarine force, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. General Wilson. Chairman, the same. I look forward to uh, any questions from the, the members here today and represent the United States Air Force that provides two-thirds of the nation's triad and three-fourths of the Nuclear Command and Control Communications. We stand ready to answer your questions. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, General Selva, yesterday I had the opportunity to tour Fort Campbell. Uh, it just reminds me that we have a lot of needs in this military. Uh, and, but, but did I hear you correctly? that there is no higher priority for the joint force than modernizing this part of our defense effort, our strategic deterrence. Mr. Chairman, we in the joint force put our nuclear deterrent as the, the number one priority for modernization and recapitalization. I would make two quick points. One, we have made several and I referred to them as considered decisions over the last decade to defer some of the modernization of that force in order to address urgent needs while still maintaining a safe, reliable, and secure arsenal and delivery capability. But in making those decisions, we have squeezed about all the life we can out of the systems we currently possess. And so that places an, an extra premium on a very deliberate long-term investment strategy to replace those systems as the existing systems age out of the inventory. And that's the reason we use the terminology. We place it as our number one priority. There is an urgency in terms of time and in terms of stable long-term investment in order to be able to deliver this capability. Okay. Let me just ask one other question for either you or General Hyten to, uh, to comment on. Um, a couple weeks there w ago, there was an article by Peter Husey, who's president of Geostrategic Analysis and guest lecturer at the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, among other things he writes in this letter is that early in the next decade, around 2020 or 2021, Russia will have modernized close to 100 percent of its bombers, land-based missiles, and submarines. And China will, by the end of the next decade, have a fully modernized and expanded nuclear deterrent with mobile ICBMs, a new missile armed submarine, and long range cruise missiles. New data now indicates that China can build a thousand new nuclear warheads quite rapidly. If the U.S. stays on its current projected course, we will at best fully modernize our nuclear deterrent by the mid 2030s, some two decades hence. He then goes on to say we're at about 10 percent of a number of warheads where we were at one time um, and talks about Russia's tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm not asking you all to comment on the accuracy of information that uh, may be and probably is classified, but, but I am asking relative to other uh, nations. Are they gaining in capability faster than we are? Uh, how, where's the momentum here? Because if, if, you, if, if he's in the ballpark of being right, that Russia will have modernized everything in a handful of years, and at best, we're two decades after that, it looks to me like we're behind in this race. But 
Chairman, thanks for the question. There's two dynamics that are at play here. One is Russia has been and continues to modernize their nuclear force, and China continues to, continues to modernize and grow their nuclear force. Those are facts. We don't have to go to intelligence to, to determine those. Having said that, the path that we have chosen to modernize and, um, and replace our existing nuclear arsenal particularly the delivery systems, the indications of warning and command and control, potentially puts us in a position not only to keep up, because we do have a qualitative advantage at this point, but to capitalize on that advantage over time by continuing to have a triad that gives us a ballistic missile force that confounds Russian and Chinese targeting, a bomber force that is resilient enough and capable enough to penetrate enemy air defenses and respond to a nuclear attack and a survivable portion of that triad in the in the case of our strategic ballistic missile submarines that gives us an ability to respond even if an adversary were to believe that they could execute a decapitating attack on our nuclear capability so it, it is our our strategy going forward to continue to modernize all three legs of the triad in order to continue to pose um, unsurvivable targeting challenges to adversaries that match us in number and very close to match us in quality to the delivery systems themselves. Okay. General Hyden, you want to add anything? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the only thing I'll add is that uh, the key to a, a, a nuclear deterrent is safe, secure, uh, reliable, and ready. Um, it has to be able to work. Now, I think the vice chairman used the term just-in-time delivery. So if you look at all of the elements, each element, leg of the triad, our, our nuclear weapon system, our nuclear commanding, and you put them all out on a table, they all deliver in just, just in time. And uh, that is the risk that we have to make sure we monitor. Because the forces that we have, the forces that we are projected to have uh, in our budget, will provide that nuclear deterrent, without a doubt as long as we can modernize according to that schedule. If those schedules slips, though, that's when we put risk at, uh, in the system. So back to what General Selva said at the beginning, we have no room for error here in getting this done because we've stre we stretched things as far as we can. Yes, sir. So, okay. Oh, Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for General Selva, uh, I'd like you to talk uh, a little bit about the long-range standoff uh, capability uh, for which you advocate. Um, talk about where it is in, in your priorities, uh, what it gains the United States, and I'd also like you to address uh, some of the concerns raised about unintended consequences uh, and uh, you know th things that we, we may want to know uh, in terms of the, the total cost of ownership uh, of these uh, strategically in terms of uh, what our adversaries or potential adversaries will interpret by that uh, and what that may invite uh, from them. Thank you, sir. Uh, several quick points. First of all, the long-range strike system is integral to extending the life and the utility of our current bomber fleet, and it also increases the number of options for the use of our future bomber fleet. In, in this respect, the missile itself imposes a cost on any potential nuclear adversary, because in addition to modernizing their nuclear arsenal, they also have to modernize their air defense arsenals. This is a, this is a strategy that we used in the 80s when we, when we uh, widely um, deployed the air launch cruise missiles into our B-52 inventory. Uh, we believe that over the course of time, to keep the B-52 viable and buy us enough time to deploy the, the B-21, we have to have a long-range standoff weapon in our inventory that poses a challenge to increasingly sophisticated air defense systems in, in any one of the potential adversary nations that we might face. And so in that, in that respect, the missile itself is an integral part of our modernization and replacement strategy. There are those who say that long-range standoff strike capabilities are inherently destabilizing. Uh, I disagree with that particular point for two reasons. One, it ignores the fact of deployment of those same systems 
by our adversaries. If you look at Russian deployments in their bomber force, they are largely composed of long-range standoff air-launched cruise missiles launched from what we would consider relatively old legacy bomber platforms. That's a challenge we're going to have to face and they're going to have to face. The second reason I think it, it is something we must introduce into our arsenal is if we don't have that capability in our arsenal, negotiating it out as a Type N class of weapon over time becomes increasingly unlikely. So the places we've had success in negotiating types and classes of weapons out of adversary nuclear arsenals in our strategic arms reductions talks has been when we possess a similar capability that poses a tactical, operational, and strategic problem for our adversaries. So I, so I am very concerned that the open debate about abandoning the system in the interest of cost actually puts us at a strategic disadvantage over the length of time. So th there's the argument on, on cost. You, you, you referenced the argument uh, that it may uh, destabilize or uh, introduce some ambiguity that could be, um, that, that could turn out badly uh, for, for both sides. And, and your response to that seems to be that uh, our adversaries uh, have this capability and, and it wouldn't be responsible for us not to, to match that. Are you, would you then say if our adversaries did not have this capability, uh, the United States would not seek to, to introduce it? I think I would say that we should take that to the table and negotiate it in a bilateral, verifiable way so that we don't give up the option and the strategic leverage that we have in the existence of the system a priori. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. A couple of administrative notes. We have obviously a lot of member interest. Uh, we need to try to just stay within the five minutes. Secondly, if, if when you all answer questions, if you talk directly into the microphone, sometimes it's hard to hear back here, and uh, that would help us. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm very grateful to represent the Savannah River site. Uh, where multiple generations have been dedicated to promoting peace through strength by building our nuclear weapons capability. In fact, uh, the staff and workers there have made, I think, a positive difference, as General Hyten has cited, protecting the nation. And so it, 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 it really is very meaningful to me that you're here today uh, and, and your success that we want to continue. General Selva, over the course of the past eight years, the military has contributed to detailed efforts to examine various options for changing the structure of the U.S. nuclear forces. We know from a GAO st study and review of these efforts that the Obama administration examined big changes, like eliminating one or more of the legs of the triad. After these reviews, reviews, President Obama ultimately concluded to retain the triad and continue pursuing the nuclear modernization plans laid out by his administration. Did the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the services recommend and support the decision to retain the triad, and, and what was the reasoning? Congressman, in advance of the consultations with President Obama's administration on uh, the status and potential options for how to manage the triad, the Joint Chiefs did meet. We did affirm the necessity to maintain a triad, largely for the reasons that I've already pointed out about, about managing the strategic risk, not only with Russia as a potential adversary, but China as a potential nuclear adversary, with an increasingly uh, uh, aggressive North Korea in her, his pursuit of nuclear weapons, and, and based on the fact of JICPOA that we have forestalled an Iranian entry into the nuclear uh, arena, but, but have not completely stopped it for the future. So based on the collection of potential threats and adversaries that exist in the world, the Joint Chiefs affirmed, <clears throat> pardon me, the necessity to maintain a triad and to modernize the weapon systems, the indications of warning, and the command and control associated with that triad. And, and I'm grateful for President Obama's decision, uh, although you referenced Iran, and I'm so concerned about the uh, continuing development of uh, missile capability, ICBMs. Uh, sadly, that can only be used uh, for the purpose of uh, my view, uh, delivery of uh, a nuclear weapon and a threat to the American people. Uh, General Hyten, we sometimes hear arguments that the triad has too much redundancy, that it will not intentionally, it's not intentionally designed, it was more by accident, and, and grew up into what it is today. 
Do you believe we should retain and modernize the full triad? And additionally, uh, what reasoning do you have on this? So I believe we should retain and modernize the triad, Congressman, absolutely. Uh, I believe that's fundamental to deterrence. Uh, in order to deter, you have to have a capability that uh, provides uh, the adversary a calculus that uh, he looks at and decides that his options will fail. If the adversary has capabilities uh, to operate um, from the sea, from the land, from the air, and we have to be able to deter in all those elements. That's how the triad was developed, and that's how we need to go. And I'll just end with uh, the fundamental statement that I'm fundamentally opposed to unilateral disarmament because that fundamentally changes the deterrent equation. Uh, we need to, uh, in deterrence, uh, parity, rough parity is actually a good thing, not a bad thing, uh, because that causes the adversary to pause when they're about to make a decision. And, and I uh, agree with your uh, analysis just there of peace through strength. Thank you very much. And both uh, General Sel Selva and General Hyten, what are your uh, view of the concerns that we are launching a new nuclear arms race with Russia by pursuing the nuclear modernization program? Congressman, I would suggest that we're not, we're not entering an arms race because we bilaterally have a verifiable inspection regime for the weapons that are deployed. We have capped the number of weapons that are available. What we are doing in this modernization program, and I very uh, bluntly try to call it a replacement program. We have to replace the systems that exist. We should replace them with systems that are viable. The Russians understand that's what we're doing. They know it's a path we're on. So we have a bilateral, mutually verifiable treaty cap at this point in, in our relationship, and I think that keeps us from entering an arms race. Sir, uh, Congressman, I agree with the Vice Chairman. Uh, we have numbers of our force, uh, 400 ICBMs, 240. SLBMs, 60 bombers, 1,550 accountable warheads. Those are defined numbers uh, that we have to meet. So we're not racing to increase that number. We're not racing to beat that number. We're, we're, we're working hard to make sure we can maintain that. Thank you very much. Mr. Moulton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here uh, today. Uh, General, I was, wondering if, uh, Joselle, I was wondering if you could talk about the Russian compliance with the intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, there have been some current concerns expressed in the press that they have not been complying. I'd like to know what your view is on that situation. We, we believe that the Russians have deployed, <coughs> pardon me, a land-based cruise missile that violates the spirit and intent of the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, we have conferred with the Russians in the bilateral consultation committee that exists underneath the New START Treaty in order to um, confront them on that deployment, uh, and we will continue to do so. The system itself presents a risk to most of our facilities in Europe, and we believe that the Russians have deliberately deployed it in order to pose a threat to NATO and to uh, facilities within the NATO area of uh, responsibility. If those discussions do not bear fruit, uh, what is the next step? What is the administration's plan to deal with what seems like a flagrant by violation of a treaty? We've, we've been asked to incorporate a set of options into the nuclear posture review, so it would be premature for me to comment on what the potential options might be for the administration to respond. Okay. Uh, it seems that this is uh, part of a broader uh, move of Russian aggression throughout uh, Europe and against, uh, against um, NATO. One of the things that concerns me is that as Russia uh, continues to threaten uh, the Baltic states, uh, may uh, not be deterred from further action in places like Ukraine, that a conventional conflict, conflict could escalate uh, to the point where it becomes nuclear. What, are the US, what is the U.S. doing uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen, that Russia does, never crosses a threshold into using tactical nuclear weapons in a theater like Eastern Europe? Congressman, never is a fairly absolute word, but our, our strategy in Europe is to maintain a, um, an inventory of non-strategic nuclear weapons that are in the hands of both the United States and our NATO allies. They are uh, operated on a category of aircraft we call dual capable aircraft, where the aircraft are designed to actually accommodate the use of nuclear weapons. Those aircraft are distributed in a very deliberate readiness process between 
U.S. forces and our NATO allies, and we believe that that capability poses a significant risk to Russia, and therefore it helps deter Russia from employing nuclear weapons on the European continent. General, I would, I would hazard to say that using the word never is not going too far when we're talking about the existential threat of no, sir, I'm not, a, not suggesting it's too far. It's just such an absolute word. I avoid it. Fair enough. Uh, what kinds of doctrine changes are we contemplating in the face of what appear to be doctrine changes on the side of the Soviet, of the Russians? So, sir, we've begun an investigation of uh, a series of potential strategy changes, many of which will have to be incorporated into the nuclear posture review. As you recall, in the, in the prior administration, we looked to limit the uh, potential use and utility of nuclear weapons in any scenario with an eye towards reducing the numbers to a much smaller inventory than we have today. A noble goal, to be sure. One of the things that happened in the context of that conversation is our adversaries started to articulate a doctrine of escalation to de-escalate. And we have to account for in our nuclear doctrine what that means and what the ladder of strategic stability implies as we look at an adversary that expresses in their rhetoric a willingness to use nuclear weapons where they may or may not actually be exercising the operational capability to do so. So we're gonna to have to get to the bottom of what that means. We've done several war games and exercises over the last couple of years. We are not done with that process, but this will be part of the nuclear posture review. General, I think you'll find bipartisan support in this committee for making sure that we have an effective nuclear uh, deterrent. But at the end of the day, I think you'd also find bipartisan support uh, for working towards strategic arms reductions. What is, the most, what is the most effective thing we can do today to head down that path? Because obviously those talks seem to be stalled. Sir, I think there are two things we can do the, from a military perspective. The first is maintain a safe, secure, reliable, and ready nuclear arsenal. And, and project to the public and to our adversaries that we take this incredibly seriously. It's why it's our top priority. The second is also emphasize that the existence of that arsenal need not be absolute, that we are open to negotiations, but they must be bilateral, they must be verifiable, and we have to go into this completely open to the idea that there are now more than just two nuclear players at a strategic level in the world. We must accommodate in our bilateral relationships with any adversary the existence of other adversaries. And so the inventory today grows. Russia and China present strategic threats to the United States if they chose to use their weapons. And our deterrent must be able to address both. If new nuclear adversaries enter the population of potential threats, we need to be ready to address them. And I think if we can balance those two things in our discussion, both publicly and privately, of what the implications are for maintenance of an arsenal and reduction of that arsenal in a measured and prudent way, we can be successful. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate you talking today to us about what you've described General Silva as the top priority. Uh, General Silva and General Hyten, I'd like to talk to you for a moment about the nuclear command and control system component of that top priority. Uh, the PowerPoint we've been given uh, describes the command and control as enabling national command conferencing, attack detection, strike planning, and dissemination of execution messages, all incredibly important. It also allows the president to have uninterrupted connectivity with nuclear forces. Admiral uh, Moran says, maintaining a credible nuclear deterrent for the long term requires recapitalization of these key systems, so we know that it's essential for our concept of a credible deterrent. General Hyten, in your written testimony, you say that our command and control system is increasingly unreliable and in desperate need of modernization. Unreliable and desperate are words that are in contrast to credible. General Selva, you say that the ability to preserve these capabilities beyond their intended lifespan is a technical achievement, acknowledging they're already past their, their lifespan. However, nuclear modernization can no longer be deferred. Well, as we talk about the issue of deterrence, uh, I would like for you to describe to me some of the risks that we're facing by doing this, because it's not just that these might not work or that we can't respond if we're attacked. Doesn't it go right to the calculation of our adversaries as to whether or not we have a credible deterrent, as we have here what is an open hearing, and we're hearing words such as unreliable and desperate, 
And we also don't have an ability to fix this tomorrow, right? Uh, gentlemen, could you, uh, General Salva, General Hyten, could you describe the risk that we're taking and the situation we're in? Congressman, I'll go first. The uh, uh, Nuclear Command and Control and Communications, NC3, is, is uh, my biggest concern when I look out towards the future. Uh, when I put all the modernization plans on the table, I see the modernization plan for the submarine, for the bomber, for the uh, long-range standoff munition, um, uh, for the uh, GBSD, I see the, the new missile, I see all those coming together. When I look out at the NC3, although uh, everything we have today works very effectively, but it is very resilient, robust, and ancient. Uh, ancient is the concern I have because an ancient command and control system uh, in today's world is very, very hard to recapitalize. And General, doesn't that mean that our adversaries know that and if they're taking a calculation as to whether or not we can credibly respond, don't they look at those issues as to our decaying infrastructure? I'm sure they do. I'm sure they look at those. We look at those very hard. Uh, that's why it's uh, my number one priority now inside the modernization piece to make sure we have a plan to modernize the nuclear command and control capability. In order to fix this, again, we can't just fix it tomorrow. You can't go down to Home Depot and buy a bunch of stuff and just plug it in and make this thing work. Um, let's talk about some of those components on, uh, on the entire system. Uh, could you speak about the ITWA system and um, what if it doesn't do its job of providing a, an early uh, warning of an attack? So the Integrated Tactical Warning and Attack Assessment System, ITWA, is the uh, it's the integrated architecture that basically goes all the way from indications and warning from our space-based constellations to our ground-based radars into the command and control system and provides the picture of any threat that would come at the United States of America. So uh, it is exercised every time there's a launch on the planet, as recently as last Sunday night. We are up most of the night watching the North Korean uh, launches of SCUDs. Uh, even though that did not present a threat to North America, we still exercise those same pieces. The satellites see the threats. If it comes into the radar fans, the radars will see it, and then the command and control system works. Uh, but as we look at that structure and we look at it 10 years from now, when you have a 20th century architecture that you're trying to maintain 10 years from now, 10 years from now is when my concern really is. Uh, it is not 2035 in the NC3 architecture. It is much more fragile than that. That's why we have to take a and, and hard doesn't, look. If it, if it doesn't work or if there's de de deficiencies in it, does our adversaries again understand that that relates so, to our ability to respond? So, Congressman, it, it works. It works every time we pull it together. My concern is, is that we're creating fragility in the future. And that fragility in the future has to be addressed, and it has to be addressed in the near term across the enterprise. That's in the Navy and in the Air Force. And can you talk about the uh, ascent system? And there's delays in this system that apparently we were not informed of. And uh, how do we address that? Congressman, uh, all of the national command and control and leadership communication systems have now been brought with the help of this committee and, and the Senate Armed Services Committee under the oversight of a single council in the Pentagon. I co-chair that council with the Director of Acquisition Technology and Logistics. It is do, do you believe that the services in DSHA sh should have to provide everything they know about delays in the system? Yes, sir. And that is precisely what that oversight council does, is it pulls all of the community of interest together so that we don't run the risk of looking at the process in eaches. We actually look at it as an entire end-to-end -end set of programs that are critical to providing nuclear command and control and connectivity to our most senior leadership. Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for your testimony today and most especially for your service uh, to the nation. Um, gentlemen, as, as you know, our, um, uh, our nuclear uh, enterprise is, is, um, is aging, and we've spoken about that several times this morning, obviously, and uh, uh, like the previous uh, member, I had the privilege of chairing the Strategic Forces Subcommittee uh, a few Congresses ago, and so I was able to do a deep dive on, on this, uh, this aging nuclear enterprise. Um, one of the things that uh, I certainly find concerning is the, the work that our adversaries uh, are doing in their nuclear programs, particularly China and Russia, and they're designing new delivery systems and, and, and warheads. And I want to touch on a, a you know, somewhat sensitive but important topic, and that's our uh, uh, nuclear warheads uh, that we have in our, in our arsenal. I know we're going through the refurbishment program. I mean, some of the, uh, the components of our warheads don't even 
uh, really exist anymore. It doesn't. Uh, it's not e easily to, to replace them. Some of the materials are not uh, not uh, easily obtainable. Um, so the the question is uh, obviously I, we're not interested in at all setting up an arms race, but does it make sense to continue to try to refurbish and and make things work, or does it make more sense uh, to design uh, a a a more modern weapon, and the question is, if so, what does that do in, in terms of, does that endanger us of setting off an arms race, and could we design a new warhead without uh, testing? Sir, one of the first priorities I engaged in when I took this job was to partner with uh, Frank Klotz at the National Nuclear Security Agency which is the, the arm of DOE that builds and does the actual physical maintenance of the warheads themselves. Uh, I, I took a trip to both Livermore and Sandia and talked to the scientists who are doing the work of design and prototyping of those, I will use the words, modernized repurposed warheads. And their belief and, and all of the information that they could present to me is that there is sufficient life and resiliency left in the warheads that we currently possess that we can very deliberately modernize them with new technologies without building new warheads and essentially replicate the capability we have today in a, in a safer, more secure, more reliable, and more resilient set of weapons without going into the detail of what that strategy looks like. So the scientists themselves, and I spent a day at each location quizzing them and having them demonstrate their beliefs, not just in showing me their conclusions, but actually showing me the math. Uh, they're convinced, as am I, that the path we're on is actually a reasonable path into the near future. That doesn't ignore the fact that sometime in the future of these weapon systems, we are actually going to have to replace the core components that still have lifetime left in them. And Congressman, I'll, I'll, I'll just add on that uh, tomorrow we'll have a classified session with uh, this committee where we'll actually bring in uh, Frank Klotz and Charlie McMillan uh, and myself and we'll sit down and we'll walk through that entire nuclear weapons piece with you as well as the threat information that we can't share in this hearing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Adam Moran, um, being from Rhode Island uh, and as co-chair of the Submarine Caucus with my good friends, Congressman Courtney and Congressman Whitman. I understand the critical importance placed on our SSBN force uh, in conjunction uh, with our nuclear deterrence. Uh, certainly as the most survivable leg of the triad, uh, the maritime force shoulders a significant burden, and the Ohio-class submarines has uh, pr primarily borne it. Uh, the existing modernization uh, projects that the Columbia-class submarines won't enter service until 2029, and that uh, the Navy, Navy will uh, only operate 10 SSBNs uh, during the, uh, the 2030s, reaching a full fleet of 12 SSBNs uh, in 2041. So, Admiral, how will, uh, uh, we, how will we sustain our nuclear deterrence requirements uh, while transitioning to the Columbia-class submarine, and what can Congress do to ensure uh, the future requirements of the Navy's nuclear submarine fleet are met? Congressman, thanks for the question. Uh, we have worked out the requirements in the 30s with uh, STRATCOM and the Joint Force. Uh, clearly, what we'll be done with recores of Ohio uh, here in the not too distant future. So that's a major draw on our total force structure, if you will. And w as you indicated, in the late 20s and early 30s, we start repl replacing Ohio with Columbia class. So we think we can accept that we're going to have to maintain a ready status of fewer submarines during the 30s but uh, uh, working that through stratcom we believe we have enough to satisfy the requirement thank you, thank you. general Selva. um for you i wanted to ask what are the the, the risks of uh, uh, launch on warning and what can be done to increase uh, presidential decision making time in the midst of a crisis Thank you, Congressman. As you are aware, the launch on warning uh, criteria basically are driven by physics. The, the amount of time the president has to make a decision is based on when we can detect a launch, what it takes to physically characterize the launch, and the entire scenario is predicated on an adversary that believes they can attack us and decapitate our 
intercontinental ballistic missile fleet without us responding. And so the, the only ways physically to buy more time for the president to make that decision are to increase the fidelity and the distribution of our radar and on-orbit detection systems. But even those criteria face the facts of physics, which say, while you may detect the launch, it must, the, the weapon itself must cross through some sort of radar detection capability in order to characterize the launch as an attack on the United States. So, so my, the short answer to your question is I don't believe the physics let us give him much more time. And so what we owe the president is a set of options ahead of time that he or she can consider and determine whether or not they are willing to take that shot because they're not going to have the benefit of a long period of time to make that decision. Thank you, General. And uh, in addition to that, obviously, I've always been a big believer that uh, good intelligence is always the very pointy tip of the spear. And uh, the, the better our intelligence is, the more uh, standoff warning time we may have as well that adds to what we already have in place. So um, I want to be respectful of other people's time. So with that, I'll, I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for being here for your service to our country. Uh, in April of 2016, the State Department released its most recent arms control compliance report. And it found in there that Russia remains in violation of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or the INF Treaty. Uh, General Selva, in your professional military view, do you believe that Russia intends to return to compliance with this treaty? Congressman, I don't have enough information on their intent to to conclude other than that they do not intend to return to compliance, absent some pressure from the international community and the United States as a, as a co-signer of the same agreement. Uh, there's, there's no trajectory in what they're doing that would indicate otherwise. And did I hear you say earlier in this hearing that uh, Russia has now deployed? Yes, sir. What is the military's assessment of the impacts of this violation? So our, our assessment of the impact is that it, it more threatens NATO and infrastructure within the European continent than any other part of uh, area of the world that, that we have national interests in or alliance interests in. And, and our intent is to factor that into the NPR and look for leverage points to attempt to get the Russians to come back into compliance. I don't know what those points are at this point in time. Uh, witnesses from the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy testified several times in the past several years that the U.S. was considering various responses, including active defense, two, counterforce, and three, countervailing capabilities. What actions have been taken in each of these three to implement such capabilities? Sir, we have, uh, I, I'd like to give you a more fulsome answer in a classified environment, but basically it's the assessment of where the Russians are deploying and how they are deploying that system that provide for the latter option, which is a countervalue or counterforce option against the actual weapon system itself, but the balance of the capabilities I'd have to talk to you about in a classified uh, environment. Okay. General Hyten and uh, General Silva, would you uh, please provide this committee before the end of the month uh, your recommendation on military options based on your best pro uh, professional military advice for options that policymakers like this committee can choose to support? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vesey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, General, uh, all, the, all the generals that are here today about the uh, F-35's uh, Block 4 dual capability platform uh, and with it being a strictly a tactical uh, complement to the strategic bomber fleet. And I was wondering, in your opinion, uh, can this platform actually supplant some functions that the bomber fleet performs in the future? Uh, in conjunction with the uh, new B-21 as our strategy evolves? Congressman, I think it's possible they can work together, but given the relatively small numbers of dual capable aircraft and the fact of that commitment only to our NATO allies, that we have not extended our dual capable aircraft outside of the European area of responsibility in more than a decade, our, our capacity to provide for a uh, extended nuclear deterrent umbrella over other allies, partners, and friends principally comes from our capacity to deploy weapons from the United States to those locations. So I'm, I'm cautious 
that we not build the connotation that because the airplanes can operate together, they would necessarily at a strategic level be, be built into the same plan. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, my next question is to uh, General uh, uh, Silver and Hyten. Uh, each element of the nuclear triad requires significant investment and modernization. Of the three, how would you rank order uh, with them in terms of priority to undergo modernization efforts? Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's choosing among your children. Uh, it's, uh, it's impossible. It depends on your perspective. You can come at it from a perspective of uh, which is the oldest. Which is the oldest? Uh, you probably go to the bomber. The bomber is the oldest. That uh, We need a, a modernized penetrating bomber. Uh, but then you look at the uh, ICBM, and the ICBM has a problem. You look at the submarine. The submarine, at some point in time, the Ohio class will not be able to go into the surface of the water. And a submarine that can't go into the surface of the water does not have a significant use to the United States of America. So. As you walk through each of those, you realize that uh, under the current construct of what deterrence is, I can't give up any element of the triad. And that's why all three have to be modernized and all three have to be monitored as you go through that. I think it's important that we look at it as each of these programs goes on and we make prudent decisions uh, concerning where we're spending our money to make sure that they deliver in time. Uh, but I, I can't make a, a determination of which one today would be the most important. Congressman, the way I would phrase it is not unlike my colleague, and that is, if you believe the triad is important, if you believe the existence of all three legs of the triad are necessary in order to deter an adversary from openly attacking the United States and denying them the capacity to be able to do that, then you have to put all three of them as, a pri as priorities and not pick and choose among the three. There are schedule realities within the triad that drive us to pay particular attention to the modernization of each leg. The, the Ohio class submarine is on a design and construction schedule that has almost no slack in it. Because of the, the dynamic that was just pointed out a few moments ago about the Ohio class reaching end of life and Columbia class having to be ready to replace her. And so that, that puts a premium on that, that design and construction schedule. The B-52 fleet, as the chairman pointed out, that is the bulk of our air leg of the triad, that fleet was built in the 50s and 60s. The weapons that they employ, the air launch cruise missile and the gravity bombs that they carry, were designed and built in the 1970s with a 10-year lifespan. We know today they remain relevant, but we can't continue to maintain them. A decade from now, those weapons will not be able to penetrate Russian air defenses, and therefore there's an urgency to their replacement. And finally, the Minuteman III missile system was put into silos in the 1970s with an expected 10-year lifespan. We have extended its lifespan and, and believe we can continue to do so for about another decade. When we did the analysis of alternatives on what would be best, extending life again or replacing, the cost of extending life actually almost matches the cost of replacement. So that means all three of them must be addressed at the same time. What we have to do and what we owe you is our considered judgment on where we put resources to make sure that all three of those replacement programs stay on a schedule for design and deployment that matches the time span that the weapons themselves will age out of the fleet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank all of you gentlemen for your lifetime commitment to, to human freedom. Uh, let me begin by suggesting that uh, the comments you made here today as to the importance of our nuclear deterrent, uh, I com so deeply agree with, given that I, I think it has kept us out of uh, involvement in a world war for 70 years. I mean, it is uh, almost impossible to overstate its significance. And with that, I'll probably go ahead and bias my question deeply and suggest to you that uh, I think that the long-range standoff capability is one of the strongest, one of the strong components uh, for rationale and for, for leverage to keep the bomber leg of our triad. And um, I know that the argument is made that, that somehow this is a destabilizing weapon, and General Selva, you had mentioned that 
earlier, and you, I thought you addressed it well, but I'd like to kind of ex expand on it slightly uh, because I think that this is one of those things that's in, in play. Um, and with that, you know, I've asked the Air Force many times now, uh, how many times, and, and General Wilson, this is uh, addressed to you too, sir, and General Hyten, um, how many times the Alcoms, uh, you know, has been fired and, uh, and how many times that uh, in combat, how many times it's been uh, taken as a potential nuclear strike? And of course, the, the answer was none. And uh, if indeed the LRSO uh, is uh, destabilizing, then so are dual capable bombers. I mean, all of these things uh, just don't make sense in my mind. And so the, the questions I have for you, um, first, you, I'm going to make a series of them because I don't want to run out of time here. Uh, what do you think of LRSO? LRSO? Uh, do you support the program? Uh, what is the military requirement for this program? Do you think it's destabilizing? And, uh, uh, and General Selvey, I'll, I'll point over to you specifically, do the Joint Chiefs of Staff support the program? And do you believe LR LRSO is a good part of, of cost-imposing strategy on our adversaries? That's a lot of questions. I'm sorry to throw it out at the same time. Congressman, the, the Joint Chiefs did consider the commitment to the LRSO and the development program when we looked at our recommendation to President Obama last year on whether or not to adjust the modernization and recapitalization program and committed to the fielding and deployment of the LRSO. We do believe that it is a significant tool for imposing costs on our potential adversaries. The requirements state in short that it be able to fly a specific range, which I won't talk about in this forum, that it be able to penetrate the sophisticated air defense defenses of an opponent and deliver a nuclear weapon. And those are the, the three baseline requirements for the system that I can talk about in this room. And you would reject again the notion that it's destabilizing? Yes, sir. And. Uh, what emphasis do you put on the, on the significance of that capability in maintaining uh, in the future uh, an effective rationale for uh, keeping our bomber leg of our triad? I think it does two things for us. We've already talked about the cost imposition on, on any potential adversary. That's a critical piece of keeping the bomber leg of the triad viable. It is also critical to keeping the B-52 viable as the airframe itself cannot penetrate Russian air defenses or Chinese air defenses for that matter, and as a consequence must have a standoff weapon that's capable of contributing to its leg of the deterrent. Yeah. General Hyten. Congressman, I'll, I will bring to the uh, classified session tomorrow a detailed explanation. Uh, there's actually an, an integrated story when you put the bomber together with the LRSO that uh, we can only talk about in a classified yeah. form that actually explains the, the military requirement very specifically on why we need that. There's a lot of policy discussions we've had today, but I think the military requirement is actually uh, the most powerful, and we can share that tomorrow. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to that. Uh, General Wilson, did you have anything to add? Congressman, I, I'd say the LRSO is the most flexible leg because when I match a weapon with all the bombers in the future, we'll, we'll go on not only the B-52, the B-50, B-2, or the B-21, uh, it provides lots of flexibility. Yeah. When you put numbers on them, again, just as the other generals have said, it, it's a cost-imposing strategy against our adversaries. Um, I think it's a, a very uh, effective uh, deterrent capability, and we'll do so in the future. Well, thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, I think that last point was very important. It gives our uh, command uh, capability opportunity to make some additional decisions if they have to, rather than having the bombers over enemy territory. And finally, I think we should reject this notion of destabilization because Russia certainly has this capability and they've continued to build on it and, and, and expand it. So um, I appreciate you all being here today and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Hanabusa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here. One of the things that um, concerned me as I was reading through everything, yes, there's an emphasis by all of you of the need for modernization and for replacement. And there's this concept of the triad. And I've heard the testimony before, and you seem to be just assuming that the triad is the way we must go. And I've heard your explanations, and I'm quite honestly, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's the way we must go. For example, the warheads you talked about in 1971, I think, was when they were put together. You all realized that it took 10 years after that before you all graduated college. 
So when we're talking about modernization, right, how or why are you all assuming that the triad system is like the essential threshold to modernization? And that is other than, if you will respond in this way, other than your respective jurisdictional areas. Thank you, ma'am, for the question. First of all, it is, it is not that the triad is foundational to modernization. We believe the triad is foundational to deterrence. It's not about how we view the triad, it's how our potential adversaries view the triad. So three times in the last five years, the Joint Staff has been asked this question. Could we go to a dyad? Could we eliminate a leg of the triad? If you were to eliminate a leg, which leg would you eliminate? The sum total of all of that analysis has resulted in a commitment on the part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to maintain the triad because of its value in deterring our opponents. It does several things for us. We've talked about the operational parts where no single leg can be taken out at one time and that presents a, a targeting and strategic problem to an adversary. The other thing it brings us is the ability strategically to hedge between legs of the triad. So if someone were to figure out how to completely defeat our bomber force, we have a fallback position. But General, you have all basically said that, that everything that we have in the triad needs to be modernized. And I believe General Wilson in his testimony said that you know the really peer that we have is Russia. There is China and North Korea who are coming on board, but our real peer in terms of this area is Russia. So I guess my, my issue is this. If we are looking at how we're going to battle into the, the quote, the modern era, I mean, we're modernizing, shouldn't we be focusing on how they are, quote, potential adversaries and the ones that we anticipate are coming on board, how they will arm and what we must do to combat that? Because it seems like we, we are sort of in this mode of, well, we, not necessarily that the triad is, is the essence of modernization, but somehow it's sacrosanct right now. And this is what we think works best. But we are talking about modernizing. We're talking about a new series of adversaries. And so how is it that you've thought about that potential and in then assuming that the triad is necessary and the way that you're all choosing to modernize within the triad is what is going to be the best way. I understand the Columbia class coming on board. I do understand that. And I understand the essence of the uh, than the quote, what we call the deep blue sea and what they need to do. However, I'm wondering about the ICBMs, where we place them, and this bomber capacity. Uh, so, Con we start from the adversary. That's where all the analysis starts. We start looking at Russia. That's where the nuclear analysis starts. And we look at China, we look at North Korea, look with Iran, but we start from what they're doing uh, because the adversary gets a vote. Uh, they get a vote and, and we don't get the vote on what they're going to do. So we have to look at what they're doing and figure out how to respond. And if you look at the role of deterrence, uh, de the primary role of deterrence is to deter the use of nuclear weapons anywhere else on the planet. And if, if you eliminate one element of the triad, the challenge that creates for us as military officers is that now we're one f failure, we're one problem away, we're one challenge away, we're one breach in intelligence away from an adversary thinking that they can possibly attack the United States with a nuclear weapon. That fundamentally changes deterrence. General, I'm going to run out of time. And what I'd like is to have you uh, respond to me in writing if, if you can. I understand that. However, when your basic essentials, which is the weaponry that we have and all of that, may not be the proper deterrent or the bombers may be something that can be detected, those are the issues that I'd like to have you respond as to how that fits into modernization. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and thanks so much for your service. Uh, General Hyten, I'd like to discuss the military requirement for the long-range standoff cruise missile in a little more detail. I want to focus on the platforms, and we have penetrating platforms like the B-2 and upcoming the B-21. Tell me why those platforms with their capability 
and them going in to deliver a gravity nuclear weapon like the B-61 uh, would not meet uh, the, the, the standards or the requirements that have been set by LRSO. Sir, I can't uh, talk about the specifics in an open hearing. I will bring those specifics into the, uh, into the closed classified session tomorrow so I can give you the number. But in general, let me just describe that it is a mix of ranges. What is the range of the long-range standoff weapon? What is the range of the bomber? What is the target that we have to do? And if you look at the globe and you look at uh, Russia and China in, in particular, they're very large countries. Uh, and, and it's about an access issue. And so we want to combine all those military requirements together and we meet the, the requirements that are in the air leg of the triad for what we have to do. That's how it comes together. And I'll show you the details tomorrow in the classified session. Congressman, if you let me add yes, yes, one more Senator. point to that, yes. and this is something that's missed quite often in the LRSO conversation. In order for a bomber to deliver gravity, to deliver a gravity bomb, it must fly over or proximate to the target. And it has to do that one target at a time. If we find ourselves in a position where we have to strike multiple targets with relative simultaneity, the lack of existence of a long-range standoff munition means we have to dedicate more force to that same problem set. And so part of the advantage in the LRSO, and it is one of the requirements, is that it be shot from some distance mm -hmm. and that it can be released from the bomber in relative uh, short order so that you can get that degree of simultaneity that you cannot get with a laydown of gravity bombs. And, and again, until or unless we negotiate cruise missiles out of everyone's nuclear arsenal, the capacity to be able to do that adds value, brings flexibility, and it confounds the enemy's belief that they might be able to attack us and get away with it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Great point. General Wilson, I wanted to um, go to you and get your perspective. We had heard some comments earlier about the, the aging inventory of our air launch cruise missiles, and we know where they are today with their age, what they were planned for originally. But tell me, what, what happens with the current age of these missiles and our ability to perform the mission if LRSO is not delivered on time? And, and do we have the same element of deterrence as that, as that inventory of air launch cruise missiles ages and if we don't get LRSO? Yeah, thank you for the question. As you uh, remarked earlier, our current cruise missiles were built in the early 80s, designed the last 10 years. We're now on their fifth SLEP, their service life extension for those missiles. To meet General Heighton's requirements, we talk about being safe, secure, effective, and ready. As, as these missiles continue to age out, they will become potentially unreliable and on one piece and not able to reach their target. So there's, a, there's an effectiveness piece and there's a reliability piece. They're currently safe, secure, effective, and reliable. But looking 10 years in the future, we don't have much slack. Again, right now we're on our fifth service life extension, and we need a new uh, replacement for that ALCA missile, the LRSO. Very good. Thank you. Admiral Moran, I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, that, that, that extraordinarily important part of the nuclear triad, our Ohio-class submarines. We are today in the process of replacing those submarines with the Columbia-class. Give me your perspective. I know that we are pushed with having the proper number of 12 submarines, which is a projection, and being for a period of time, as you spoke of earlier, at 11 submarines. Give me, give me your perspective on what we will do to accommodate for that, for that lower number of submarines through that period of time. Is it longer deployments at sea? What, what do we do to make sure we have the proper presence there? Because as we know, uh, we need 11 submarines to have a presence, I believe, at any one time of six submarines at sea. Can you give us perspective about how you create that balance and why 11 is going to be sufficient for the mission through that time frame? Uh, thank you, sir. You, you captured it quite well there in terms of length of deployments and how, how much longer we would be able to sustain a crew at sea or turn around a crew at sea, shorter durations. So uh, there are several aspects of what you described that we can we can do to uh, make up that delta. The biggest one is the maintenance of those existing Ohio as they reach the end of their life and the new Columbia as they come in in the 30s. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for coming here today. 
The Congressional Budget Office estimates the cost of modernizing U.S. nuclear deterrent uh, will cost about $400 billion over the next decade. Reports also indicate U.S. will spend $1 trillion over the next 30 years in order to modernize and maintain our nuclear triad. All our, win all our witnesses have expressed the importance of modernizing our nuclear capabilities and the risks of continuing to use systems that are operating beyond their service life. To this end, I believe it is imperative for this committee to be informed of the long-term plans, timelines, and cost projections of implementing such a costly and extensive modernization program. This is the National Nuclear Security Administration's annual report that covers DOE's costs and plans for nuclear warheads and related infrastructure over the next 25 years. General Selva, can DOD provide this committee with its 25-year plan, timelines, and cost estimates in regards to its nuclear modernization efforts? If yes, when? And if no, why not? Congressman, my understanding is we communicated those requirements in our uh, president's budget in 17. They will be recommunicated as part of our program, but I will be happy to work with our team back in the Pentagon and come back to you with a more fulsome answer to your question over the next decade to decade and a half. Uh, our numbers are slightly different than CBOs for, for a couple of reasons, but, but we'll work through that with you and, and make sure you have the numbers. Great. Thank you very much. I yield, Mr. Chair. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Wilson, there are uh, large differences in the opinion of the Air Force and the Office of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation at the Secretary of Defense. Uh, why are there such uh, large differences on the assessment of the ground-based strategic deterrent? Uh, does the Air Force stand behind uh, its service cost position? And when will the Air Force and CAPE have enough da data to revisit and revise their cost estimates and narrow the uh, range that we're seeing? Hey, Congressman Scott, we certainly stand behind our projections. Uh, quite frankly, the, the projections differ because we use different uh, sources. We haven't built a new missile in many years, so we used Minuteman 3 and Peacekeeper data. The CAPE used uh, D5 data as well as MDA data, um, and therefore the differences in the, in the two uh, service cost positions. We expect to have, uh, we've got our proposals in now, and about a year from now, this March of 18, we should have further data to be able to refine that and provide that forward. Okay, thank you. General Hyten, would you uh, please describe the military requirements driving the need for GBSD? Uh, what are the military effectiveness and cost implications of choosing to life extend the current Minuteman III missile fleet and related ground infrastructure rather than pursue uh, GBSD? So the, uh, the detailed military requirements are, are classified, sir. We can provide you th those in a separate form to be glad to okay. do that. Uh, in, in in general, the requirement for the land-based element of the triad is to be able to provide a, uh, a survivable, responsive capability uh, to any uh, threat attack that is coming from any adversary around the globe. Uh, we have to be able to do that inside the timelines of what that adversary missile, and if you just do the math, the public math is it's about 30 minutes from Russia to the United States. Uh, so. Uh, that drives the timelines that we have to respond. That not only describes the, uh, drives the missile capabilities, but it describes the infrastructure it has to be put into, as well as the command and control with it. General Selva, uh, if you can't speak to it in this forum, perhaps uh, tomorrow, what is the collective judgment of the Joint Chiefs on whether we should pursue the GBSD program and retain the land-based leg of the triad? The Joint Chiefs have endorsed moving forward with the uh, ground-based strategic deterrent program based in large part on an analysis of alternatives that was done for the Joint Requirements Oversight Council that incorporated in one of its excursions life extension of the Minuteman III versus deployment of a new missile, and the costs were seen to be equivalent, if not prohibitive, for the continued life extension of the Minuteman III. 
Thank you. General Hyten, we've seen a lot of GBSD acquisition details loaded into unclassified acquisition databases and run by the Air Force. Uh, we all know that Russia, China, and others scoop all of this stuff up uh, to the best of their abilities and analyze it intensively. Why is all this put out in the open? Should we reassess what is unclassified in these acquisition documents? And uh, could you speak to also the greatest cost and technical risk in the GBSD program? For example, what is your view of the priority of possible uh, mobile command and control concepts being considered? So the, um, I, I hate the stuff that shows up in the press. I think we should reassess that. Uh, just to, to complete that thought, I hate the fact that cost estimates show up in the press as well. Uh, because if you put a cost estimate out in the press, it's not only our adversaries that are looking at it, but the people that are going to build the system are looking at that. And if that's what our cost estimates say, if we say it's going to cost $80 million, it's probably going to end up costing $80 billion. I hate that we go down that path. And then some. And then some. So I, I would really like to figure out a different way to do business than that. I hate seeing that kind of information in the newspaper. Now, as for the complications in the GBSD program, I think the, you know, we spend all our time talking about the missile. The missile, to me, is the easiest part of the structure. Everybody thinks about the missile. How much is the missile going to cost? How much is that? Uh, the last, I, just a couple weeks ago, I was at F.E. Warren in, in Wyoming. I went down uh, in one of the missile holes, and uh, the sign, as you came in, said, you know, this was created in 1963. Uh, that structure was created in 1963. Uh, the command and control assets that go around with were, were started in the 60s, modernized in the 70s. They've gone through multiple life extension programs. It's the infrastructure that is around the missile that will be the challenge of the program, not the missile itself. Gentlemen, thank you for your uh, service. My time's about to expire. So Mr. Chairman, I yield back the eight seconds. <laughs> and we'll take it, uh, Mr. O'Halloran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, General Silva, I, you had mentioned uh, in your written comments about uh, the six and a half percent projection moving forward. Uh, is how do we know that that's going to be enough money to be able to deal with the multitude of issues we've here, whether it's command and control or new systems coming on board? So all I can tell you is that that is our best judgment of what resources we're going to need to do the modernization on the schedule that we have laid it out. So that 6.5% estimate is actually based on taking all of the design and build programs and projecting them forward as a percentage of our base budget. Uh, Admiral Moran, uh, the Columbia class, uh, the minimum or, or the, the minimum that we need are 10 at a time, or 10. Uh, two are going to be down because of reactors uh, replacement at times? Uh, no, sir. The, the, the Columbia class has a, a reactor core that it will last for 40, year, 40 plus years. So we will not have to recore those unless we extend the okay. life beyond 42 years. I misread that then. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you. The, very the much. other two, the reduction from 14 to 12 is to account for the fact that the, the core lasts that long. And, and there's other maintenance that has to be done on any ship. And that's why we're able to do it with the 12 instead of the 14. Okay. Thank you. And General Hayton, uh, the cyber warfare aspects of all this, command and control, and, and the, uh, how does that, has that factored into your cost estimates? So uh, I'll just say that, you know, uh, we were having a conversation with Congressman Turner a while ago about uh, uh, the, the concerns about the NC3 capabilities that we have today. The good news about the nuclear command and control capability we have today is very cyber secure. Uh, when you build a system in the 60s, uh, before anybody knew what the term cyber was, you have inherently built in an amazing amount of cybersecurity. Uh, the challenge that we have as we go into the future is that you can't build that again. We have to fundamentally build it now in a 21st century architecture, which will have the cyber threat that we have to work through. That is a, a significant element of our risk assessment as we go through and part of the design criteria as we look at how we're going to do this nuclear command and control in the future. In general, uh, you, you, I mentioned cost also. How does that factor in as far as being able to fund the other systems which all require cyber, cyber I, issues also? It's a, it's a significant element of the cost estimates. You'd have to ask the services for the, for the details that are in those cost estimates. But I've talked to the, uh, the DOD uh, CIO in particular about that 
capability I've sat in on the panels that General Selva was talking about a while ago. Uh, we look at those very close, and that cyber security, cyber resilience, cyber defense architecture is involved in every one of the plans that we co come up with, as well as the cost estimates. Okay. Uh, thank you, and Mr. Chairman, and I yield. Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Selva, uh, you spoke with a bunch of us yesterday uh, regarding the uh, uh, the aging of our nuclear forces, and uh, you know we've talked about a lot of the slippage issues that uh, we want to avoid. Uh, General Hyten, what are the impacts to the credibility of our nuclear turn if we see major schedule slips to any of these programs? Uh, Congressman, that is the risk in the, in the program right now. Um, I've been involved in this business long enough to know that if you have five different programs that all deliver just in time, you've inherently put a risk in the program that is very significant because, sadly, one of those programs, two of those programs, three of those programs, they won't all deliver on time. Therefore, that is why we have to manage it very closely. And that's why stable budgets, stable planning, stable structure um, is so important to the entire Department of Defense, but in this area in particular, because without that stability, we really do uh, insert risk into the uh, systems in the future. Okay. Uh, Chairman Thornberry mentioned earlier that uh, this, the cost uh, for this deterrence program is usually about 6 to 7 percent of the budget. Um, considering that uh, this has been called the nation's highest priority defense mission, uh, do you agree with CBO that roughly 6 percent is a proper amount? Congressman, we've looked at the numbers for the better part of the 18 months or so I've been in this job uh, and have scrubbed them really hard. Uh, part of the debate about how much is enough came from how much is it going to cost. And so we, we scrubbed every program to take any excess cost out of it. Six and a half percent is where we land. On any given day, we spend almost three and a half percent of our defense base budget on maintaining the existing strategic deterrent. So what we're talking about is a period of time, roughly a decade and change, where we have to double that investment to continue to maintain the existing deterrent and field its replacement. And, and that's the consequence of where those numbers came from. Okay, I'd like to thank all you gentlemen for being here today, and I yield back my Thanks, time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Garamendi. A gentleman, thank you very much for your service and for the uh, questions that you've answered. I look forward to the classified hearing where we can get into this in much more depth. Uh, but uh, General Hayden, a question for you. Uh, last week, uh, Lieutenant General Jack Weinstein stated that the New START has huge value for the United States and that the agreement has been good for us. He noted that the reason you do a treaty is not to cut forces but to maintain strategic stability among world powers. And the New START Treaty allowed us to maintain that stability. Those are his quotes. If the United States with, and the question for you, if the United States withdrew from the New START or took steps which called into question our treaty obligation, what would be the effect on strategic stability? So, Congressman, uh, I've stated for the record in the past, and I'll state again that I'm a, uh, a big supporter of the New START Agreement. Uh, I believe that. Uh, especially when it comes to nuclear weapons and nuclear capabilities, that uh, bilateral, verifiable arms control agreements are essential to our ability to provide an effective deterrent. If you, move th if you remove that ef effective deterrent structure, uh, which is the New START Treaty, it makes it very difficult for us to know the levels. The risk would be an arms race. We are not in an arms race now, to go back to a, a previous question. Um, the concern would be, what do we have to do in order to stay at the same level as our adversaries? Um, and that could be a, a very risky uh, proposition. That's why I continue to support the new start levels that we're under right now. Thank you, General. General Silva, are you in the same mind? I am, sir. When, uh, when the new start treaty was brought to the Congress for ratification, the Joint Chiefs reviewed the components of the treaty and, and endorsed it. Uh, it is a bilateral ver verifiable agreement that gives us some degree of predictability on what our potential adversaries look like. Now, keeping that in mind, 
there's been discussion about uh, new tactical or new low-yield strategic weapons. Maybe they're both tactical as well as strategic. The Defense Science Board, in their um, seven defense priorities for the new administration, uh, recommended expanding our nuclear options, including deploying low-yield weapons on strategic delivery systems. Is there a military requirement for these new weapons? So, Congressman, uh, that's a great conversation to tomorrow when I can tell you the details. But from a, from a big picture perspective in, in a public hearing, uh, I can tell you that uh, our force structure now actually has a, a number of uh, capabilities that uh, provide the President of the United States uh, a variety of options to respond to any numbers of threats. And uh, I will also say that I don't, I don't agree with the term tactical nuclear weapon. I just fundamentally disagree that there is such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. I believe that anybody that employs a nuclear weapon in the world has created a strategic effect and all nuclear weapons are strategic. I thank you for that statement. I think it's accurate. And that goes to escalate to de-escalate. That also goes to our deployment of tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. General Silva, you spoke to this earlier about the um, dual capable uh, aircraft that we have in Europe. And the purpose of those apparently is to cause Russia not to um, invade. So that is an escalation to de-escalate, or could be. Congressman, not to be argumentative, the stated purpose of those weapons is to deter the Russians from escalating to nuclear warfare in order to prevent a conventional attack from going nuclear. They are, uh, I use the NATO nomenclature, non-strategic nuclear weapons, accepting what General Hyten just said. Um, but I take your point, and, uh, but the, intent, the stated intended purpose of those weapons is to deter the Russians from using nuclear weapons if they were to attempt to escalate a conventional war. All of which creates a conundrum. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I yield back. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to zoom back out, if we could, to the strategic level. The last nuclear posture review uh, was published seven years ago. The world, obviously, is very different today than it was in 2010, particularly when talking about countries like Russia. Today, at least from my perspective, it's hard to see Russia as a partner and a friend like the 2010 NPR envision. For instance, Russia continues to make dangerous and aggressive nuclear threats and exercises directed against the U.S., NATO allies, and neighbors. Russia has declared an openly discussed doctrine to use a Russian nuclear weapon early in a conflict to de-escalate and get the United States to back down. Russia continues to brazenly violate the INF Treaty, and a recent media report indicates its INF violating cruise missile is now operational and deployed. Russia intentionally broadcast plans for its so-called status, status 6 nuclear weapon, which is a high-speed unmanned underwater vehicle that would carry a megaton-class nuclear weapon into a U.S. harbor and detonate, not to mention the invasion, occupation, and annexation of the sovereign territory of its neighbors. Would you please, this is a question really for uh, the entire panel, starting with General Silva, would you please provide in your professional military views what has changed in the world, in your professional opinion, since the 2010, 2010 NPR? And why, from a military perspective, does that matter? Yes, sir, I'd make two points. One, I've been public with the notion that Russia and China are the two nations in the world that potentially pose an existential threat to the United States. Uh, I'm on the record in my confirmation hearing as the vice chairman saying the same. Uh, what's changed in the last 10 years is, the re is a continuing realization that Russia intends to assert themselves as a great power and in doing so has, has changed the relationship in terms of our military to military qualitative and quantitative match, and we have to address that. And so as we enter this first, in, the first NPR of this administration, Nuclear Posture Review of the Trump administration, one of the very key questions that will have to be asked as we start the process from the intelligence community is a definitive answer to what has changed since the last time we did this work. To be fair to the Obama administration, there was a 2010 NPR. There were two major nuclear strategy reviews in 2012 and 2014 as well, but they didn't raise to the status of an NPR because the president didn't believe we needed to do one. So a lot has changed, Congressman, to your point. 
So, Congressman, the Vice Chairman hit uh, pretty much all the points I wanted to make, uh, with the exception of one broad issue that has changed significantly since 2010. Since 2010, our potential adversaries, particularly China and Russia, have not just looked at the nuclear uh, enterprise, they've looked at uh, space and cyber. And strategic deterrence in the 21st century is much bigger than nuclear deterrence was in the 20th century. Um, we have adversaries that are building uh, weapons and capabilities to counter our adv uh, advantages in space and in cyber. We have to look at the entire strategic landscape and make sure we did deter all that action. The nuclear uh, capabilities that we have is the backstop for all of that, but it's a much broader issue that has become very apparent since 2010. Congressman, I don't have much to add there, except that when we look just Navy to Navy and the capabilities that the Russians have deployed since the last nuclear posture review are significantly better than what we saw leading up to that review. So we have to account for that in, uh, in this next step. Congressman, the only thing I'd add to, to tag on to General Hyten's comment is when we talk about the nuclear triad, we have to realize it's bigger than the, just the bombers, the ICBMs, and the submarines. It is a command and control, it's space, it's tankers, it's, it's a, a much bigger enterprise than just the three legs of the triad that we've got to be thinking about. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the rest of my time. Mr. McEachin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my question has been asked and answered, and uh, I've enjoyed listening and learning today, so I yield back. Excuse me, Ms. McSally. Ms. McSally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, good discussion today about the importance of um, investing and in recapitalization of, of the triad. Uh, I want to talk about uh, an important element of that, which is the human capital, and specifically, uh, General Wilson, the missileers and the ICBM force. I mean, we've uh, seen over, over the last year some challenges there. Um, you know, we're in a new time, and we're with a different generation. I don't like to make generalizations, but the old SAC warriors that uh, we all know and love are very different from the mindset of uh, millennials uh, coming into this role. Uh, there's real challenges. They're going to, no uh, insult to my colleagues from these states, but challenging geographic locations. Uh, Effie Warren was our sister squadron when I was at the academy. Uh, for many years, you know, often no deployments. And they see that they're working with old technology, too. So that shows, I think, that, that you know, hey, this isn't a priority for us to be further investing in that. Um, we've addressed some of these shortfalls very much in, I think, a punitive way. I mean, obviously, it's appropriate to have zero fail, but that doesn't help with morale, culture, uh, motivation, and all the important things that we need for people to be motivated to, to do this important mission. So as we're looking at modernizing uh, uh, parts of the infrastructure and the force. Are we looking at modernizing the workforce? So are we thinking outside the box? Does it need to be a dedicated career field anymore? Are there ways for them to become the deterrent experts for our uh, military, not just in nuclear deterrence? Is there uh, a thought of how to uh, do some innovative things for their leadership development while they're in these assignments that's not fake but actually very real and shows that value? So I'm just wondering, are we willing to shake up and look at some fresh ideas to modernize the workforce? It's very important. The short answer is absolutely, and that's a key part of it that you're hitting on is this human weapon system. So coming out of the force improvement program, both the internal and external reviews hit upon this piece of culture. And I would say the culture had gone to a culture of micromanagement. And so today's uh, workforce, we're focusing on this, how do I empower our airmen? Uh, and how do they see themselves in a future of which they believe what they're doing is important? So for a long time, our nation didn't, I would argue, didn't value the nuclear force. We have to change that at all levels. And so how do we then develop and grow airmen that, that realize that what they're doing is important and then they can do something about it? We have certainly lots of opportunities that we develop uh, our, our missileers uh, in, in empowering them earlier, where they become an expert in their weapon system. We make them flight commanders in our weapon system. We send them to weapon school. We're sending them to very prestigious universities, to Stanford's, to Harvard's for training. We set up the School for Advanced Nuclear Deterrence Studies there at Kirtland Air Force Base, which is focused on how do I build a, a person who can understand and articulate what deterrence means in the 21st century. So the short answer is yes. We're, we're, we think that this is a really important part of changing the culture, and you're hitting on a big piece Thank of Thank you. General Heitner, General Slovig, any other comments on that? I, I'd like to add something, ma'am. Uh, one of the things I do on holidays is I just uh, pick up the phone and uh, I punch the the number for the folks that are in the missile fields. Uh, because when I left the enterprise, really in 2009, the morale was really bad, mm -hmm. really bad. And, uh, and I, you saw that you couldn't miss it. 
Uh, and now, I, I, when I talk to lieutenants, and it's mostly lieutenants uh, that are there, their morale is high. They are all excited about what they do. They understand the importance. They understand it is the most important thing. But I think one of the things that you mentioned is that uh, that can be a temporary issue. Uh, that, that's the power of leadership, and leadership is good. But we need to follow it up with real capabilities where they're operating on 21st century equipment. They're operating those kind of pieces. And if, if we don't follow through on that, uh, I'm afraid that the morale could go back in the other direction. But right now, through the power of leadership and focused effort, I, I'm, I'm very pleased at how high the morale is in the missile field. So you think the punitive culture that I'm talking about is is behind us? We need to hold people account accountable, don't get me wrong. But when you feel like I'm going to be punished for all little things, that's a morale. So, so the, change, you know. the change that's made is really good is because uh, the no-fail is now a no-fail mission. Yeah. It's not a no-fail person. It is a no-fail mission. And when, when you realize it's the entire team that has to come together, and if, if there's a, a glitch on one person in the team, whether that's the security forces or wherever it is, and the rest of the team can overcome that and have a no-fail mission, that's what we're trying to mm -hmm. get after. And that's the conversation I hear now with the lieutenants in particular. Great. General Silva, anything? Uh, I think I'd make two points very quickly. One is a path to leadership and a continuing real emphasis on relevance and the importance of the mission. And what I see when I go out to missile bases, bomber bases, and submarine bases is a group of very motivated, very dedicated and disciplined sailors and airmen who see both of those right now. That has not always been the case, particularly in some of the incidents that we saw inside the ballistic missile force and in a small element of the bomber force. So I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm generally not an optimistic person that we have put in place a pathway that, that attends to the pre professional development and the future of the officers and the young airmen in the Air Force that we're asking to do this mission. And in, and in the case of the Navy, the sailors and the officers who are manning our strategic ballistic missile submarines and the infrastructure that supports them. Great, thanks. I'm over my time. I appreciate it. Ms. Hartzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our Oversight Investigations Subcommittee is going to have a hearing next week on infrastructure problems at the Department of Energy's Nuclear Weapons Enterprise. They have an almost $4 billion backlog in deferred maintenance and are operating in facilities that date back to the Manhattan Project. And I realize that the facilities still comply with nuclear safety requirements, but I am not sure how long that will last. And so General Selva and General Hyten, I know that you've both had the opportunity to visit some of these important DOE facilities. Can you tell us about the state of their infrastructure, any views that you have on the need to rebuild NNSA's facilities so that they can deliver on their mission to support the military? Ma'am, I think it's really important that we get at the infrastructure shortfalls inside of DOE. To that end, inside the department, we host every other month a group we call the Nuclear Weapons Council that looks at the safety, security, and reliability of the arsenal itself and then attends to the issues in partnership between the National Nuclear Security Agency, DOE, and DOD to the emerging infrastructure needs and human capital needs inside of that workforce that, that assembles and maintains the core parts of our nuclear arsenal, and those are the weapons themselves. Very good. John Hype. Uh, Ma'am, the, uh, the Department of Energy has taken that on pretty seriously, but as uh, it's been about a year since I was at the three national labs in particular, uh, Livermore, uh, Sandia, and Los Alamos. And, uh, that there's really two issues that you have to look at and two issues that I look at when I go there. One is the people, uh, and number two is the infrastructure. Uh, and each of the labs has done a, a very interesting uh, recruitment process on the, on the people. And now they have this young set of physicists and engineers that have been brought on board that are some of the best and brightest in the country that really set up for that structure. But it goes back to the same conversation I was just having with Congresswoman McSally, is that it's if you don't follow up with the infrastructure and all the other pieces that come with that, you put that at risk because people that are that bright have choices in this country today, and we want them to be able to do that. So the infrastructure is a significant issue, uh, and we need to go after that as an enterprise. That is a national security issue. That's why the Department of Defense is interested. Ma'am, if you'd allow me to make a follow-up sure. point, and that is we, we tend to be focused on the physicists, the scientists, and the designers that do the work of designing and analyzing the weapons that we employ. In point of fact, the infrastructure has a huge impact 
on the young mechanics and machinists who are the people that are touching the weapons and actually assembling them. And, it, and to see the discipline that they put in to the work that they do to disassemble and reassemble nuclear weapons, and they know precisely what that means. And to have them working in infrastructure, some of which dates back to the Manhattan Project, and they have to deal with not only the safety and security of the weapons, but the physical environment that they work in. My worry is for that part of the workforce, mm -hmm. because they can come and go as they please, and we have to address their capacity to do the work we're asking them to do, which is a fairly major process of remanufacturing weapons to meet the requirements for the future. I really appreciate those comments, and those will help build into what we're going to look at next week. So thank you for sharing your views on that. Let's talk about non-strategic nuclear weapons. Because there's a gross disparity on that front between the United States and Russia, and they're not covered by any treaty. So, uh, General Hyten, would you please compare and contrast the U.S. stockpile of non-strategic nuclear weapons versus that of Russia? And in general, unclassified terms, would you describe our respective stockpiles as equal in size and capabilities? Uh, I believe our stockpile al allows us to provide an effective strategic deterrent. Um, uh, again, I, l I have a unique perspective as a commander of strategic command, but I look at every nuclear weapon as uh, having a strategic impact. Uh, so uh, as I look at what Russia is doing, I'm very concerned about that. That's why I agree with the vice chairman in his discussions earlier about the need for future uh, bilateral verifiable um, arms uh, control um, discussions with Russia, China, all of the players, and so that we can look at exactly where we're going in the future, and all of those things should be discussed. So what about the numbers? Uh, the, num the, the Russian numbers are huge and our numbers are small. We'll show you the specific numbers uh, tomorrow, uh, but that's because we have, our nuclear weapons are a strategic deterrent. Fifteen seconds. Where are we in our modernization compared to Russian modernization of the weapons? The modernization of the weapons, um, I, don't, I don't have a detailed insight into the nuclear weapon modernization in Russia or China, but I can, I can tell you that they are across the nuclear enterprise, um, ahead of us in some areas of modernization, uh, behind in other areas, but in general, uh, we can still provide the effective strategic deterrent we have to in this nation, but we have to step forward quickly into the modernization realm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all four of you for being here. We respect the leadership that, you, that you're giving your organizations and grateful. I wanted to ask a question about unmanned aerial vehicles and protecting our strategic installations. We're seeing a growing threat, whether it's uh, other countries or even terrorists buying commercial uh, drones or whatever it may be, and, and it's a threat to our installation. So in, in the FY17 NDAA, the Secretary of Defense was given authority to field and equip, train, forces to defend our installation. So I had two questions, really. One to the force providers, Admiral Moran and General Wilson. Are we starting the process of fielding and equipping this capability to defend our bases? Then I wanted to ask General Hyten if he could comment about, is he seeing the results? Do we need to do more? And how can we help? Admiral Moran. Sir, thanks for the question. Uh, as you know, we, we have seen this uh, issue uh, around our, our submarine bases, and it is very concerning. W there's a lot of technical work going on to address the issue. I think the more important aspects of this discussion, though, are the policy and authorities to deal with them. So not only here in the U.S., but as well as overseas on the un unmanned aerial threats that are developing worldwide. Thank you, Admiral. Joe Wilson. Yeah, Congressman Bacon, the, uh, there's a big team looking at this from across the Joint Staff and Interagency to be able to get at those uh, questions that you just asked. Are we fielding Cape Bilty? I would say right now we're, we're giving, um, delivering on the first initial uh, tranche of capability, but there's a lot of work to do. This is a very complicated threat, mm -hmm. uh, and we're learning more every day. So we have a bunch of projects under work with a bunch of different agencies, but in terms of actually delivering capability to the field, we're not there yet. And yeah, the threat's there and it's growing. Right. General Hyten, how are we doing and what can we do to help? We're going too slow. Uh, we, uh, we're going too slow both on the material solution side as well as the policy and authority side. The, the NDA was uh, enormously helpful in, st in starting us down the policy and authority side. Um, but holy cow, the number of lawyers that are involved in this discussion right now are just, uh, well, it's significant. Uh, we have to get the right policy and authorities out so our defenders know exactly what to do. Then we have to give them the material solutions, allow them to react when they, they see a threat. 
and, and identify that it is a threat, and so they do the right things. We're just going way too slow, and we need to accelerate that process across policies, authorities, and material solutions. Well, thank you, Gerald Hyten. Ho hopefully, in this committee, will help give a nudge on that as well. I wanted to ask one follow-up question or on the command and control. I used to fly in the Avon Cap, as you may know. I was the, one of the flag officers on there. It was really old technology. I want to get your opinion, General Hyten. Should we uh, be re recapitalizing that entire fleet? Do we have enough numbers to do 24-hour operations if you wanted to go to that again? And how does this work with the alert force doing it off it, but based on another base? Do we need to relook at that? Thank you. So uh, I believe that uh, our airborne command and control across the board, including the Avon Cap and the Takamo, which is the same aircraft right now, both uh, have a recapitalization issue that's out in the future too, and we need to start looking at that right now. So I've asked the Navy uh, to start looking at that. I'll, I'll ask Admiral Rand to talk about those kind of pieces, but I know they're going through an analysis right now to determine what the right way is to get after those, but that's really in the service uh, line. Just a quick follow-up, do we have the right number too if you wanted to go to back to 24-hour operations? God forbid if the world deteriorates. So, so that's a, a good theoretical question because the theoretical question, when you actually put it out on a whiteboard, it works. Uh, but when you have an airplane that, that, that's that old, how long you can actually keep that going is the question. Uh, there's no doubt that we could exercise it right now. We could go to 24-7 ops. But when you're operating an aircraft that old, how long will they fly? And, and since we haven't done 24-7 ops for a while, that is a, that is a risk issue. Now, we look at it really hard. We believe that we can do that. We know we can execute it for a significant period of time, but we don't know if it's a month, two months, three months, four months, uh, because they're old airplanes. Thank you. Admiral Moran, appreciate your follow-up. Oh, yes, sir. We, uh, I, I, we are jointly working on, on figuring out a common airframe to satisfy the missions of both, both services. Uh, we currently have a plan in place to extend a service life for re 6s out to 2038, which will make them 49 years old. So you, you know what that's all about. Uh, that, that cannot be the final solution here. So we're looking, uh, as the general uh, indicated, at a way to get at a joint program or at least a, a common airframe to satisfy both missions. Thank you. And uh, Chairman, I yield back. Dr. Abraham. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Silva, thank you for hosting us, some of us, yesterday on the, uh, aboard the National Airborne Operations Center. It was instructional, educational, and it certainly highlighted how important it is to maintain and modernize the triad, that the diet is not enough, and we need all three legs of the stool to keep America safe. So uh, thank you again for that. I'm going to ask some rapid fire questions. A lot of these have been answered. I want to put them in one question format so we can refer back and we talk to our colleagues and educate them of how important it is to, uh, to fund these issues. General Wilson, how old is the B-52? B-52s were built, most of them, in 1960. And how old will it be when we plan to retire it? Uh, we're planning to fly it through 2050, so it'll be 90 years old. Wow. How old are the B-2s and how old will they be when they retire? Uh, B-2s today are 24 years old. We're scheduled to fly them through 2058, so they'll be in the mid-60s. How old is the Minuteman III? Built in 1970, but it's really built with Minuteman I parts, which are 1960. How old will it be when it's retired in 2030? Uh, it, it, really old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 60. What, what, what was it designed to do? What was its lifetime designed design to Design life was 10 years. Wow. Admiral Moran, how old will the Ohio-class submarines be when they were retired? They'll be 42 years. It's unusual for a submarine to... It was designed uh, for 30 years, so we've got a 40% increase in its service life through engineering. And that brings risk, I'm sure? Yes, sir. We can't go beyond 42. I got you. General Hyden, what's the average age of our nuclear warheads? Uh, the average age of our nuclear warheads is uh, 26 years old right now. Okay. And one more for you, General Wilson. Uh, on the nuclear weapons storage facility, I know most of them are, or a lot of them are, are so updated that we can't store there. So we're having to store warheads in one place, and Barksdale in Louisiana has to go pick those warheads up if they need to fly an operational mission. What does that do with readiness? Well, it just puts a stress on the force, and we've got to, um, when we consolidate to one place, it provides vulnerabilities. We have a plan to get after that to remodernize all of our weapons storage facilities. We'll start here with the first one here at F.E. Warren. Uh, after that, we'll become Barksdale and Malmstrom. Uh, and over the next 13 years, we have a plan to replace all 
all of our weapons storage facilities. Okay. Thank you for your service, gentlemen. Chairman, I yield back. General Wilson, I don't think anybody asked you directly today the status of the new bomber program. Is it on time, on schedule, moving ahead as it should? Hey, Chairman, uh, the Chief of Staff, the Secretary of the Air Force, and I receive regular updates on it. They just finished a, a preliminary design review recently. Uh, it's making great progress, and we're pleased with, with the way it's headed. And, and so it's where it should be at this point? Yes, sir. Okay, and Admiral Moran, let me ask you about the Columbia class. Uh, we've heard there's no slack today. Is it on time, on schedule? Are you satisfied with where it is today? Uh, we are on time and on schedule. I'm not satisfied with how much margin we have and, and obvious the impacts and, and risk to delivering on time, but uh, I'm very comfortable with where we are on the schedule and the costing today. Okay. Uh, General Hyten, a few moments ago, you made an interesting point. Uh, we tend to think of strategic deterrence as nuclear deterrence, but it's broader than that. Uh, there are other implications. There are press reports, and, and, and actually I think uh, some of this has been confirmed, that other nations are trying to deny our uh, ability uh, to operate in space and from space. That has implications for the broader sense of strategic deterrence. Um, I'd, I'd ask you or, or General Silva, what should potential adversaries understand about uh, attacks on our space system and how we would view such attacks? So attacks in space uh, in general are bad, bad for the United States, bad for the world. Uh, anything that creates debris in space uh, lessens our ability to explore. Uh, we all, I think all nations of the world have the desire to explore the heavens and if we contaminate the space environment, we can never, we can never do that. So uh, it's important for us to protect that environment as we go forward. When you look at what adversaries are doing, they're clearly building capabilities to deny us. Uh, some of those capabilities could go after our strategic um, early warning systems. If there's an attack on our strategic early warning systems, our adversaries need to realize that they have just crossed a threshold that uh, puts our understanding of what their actions are at risk and creates a, a potential issue that we may have to respond to in the broader strategic deterrent construct. Uh, everything is, in, uh, is integrated. Uh, an attack against uh, uh, an overhead satellite of, of a tactical variety has one impact, a strategic variety had another impact, but they're all bad. So our desire is to deter bad behavior in space, to deter any kind of activity in space that would harm this, the space environment. And so the message to our adversaries that you ask is that they should know that we're watching very, very closely and we're developing capabilities to allow us to continue to fight through and respond to any attack that would come in the space domain now and in the future. General Silva, you have anything? Chairman, just quite briefly, specific to the conversation we've been having today, the delineation between the indications and warning and command and control satellites is a signal we should send to our potential adversaries that crossing that line in space denies us visibility into their actions and intentions and therefore creates ambiguity that's not helpful in terms of nuclear deterrence on both sides of the equation. I think that's a clear message we have to send every single day. Okay. Um, General Hutton, on nuclear command and control, as, as you were talking about that being the thing you're most concerned about, um, it, it goes through my mind about what I, what I describe as a ghost fleet phenomena. Are we better off to have 1960s technology that cannot be hacked into uh, and, and have more reliability with that ancient sort of approach than if we were to update it? So, sir, I've asked that question myself. Uh, and there's two pieces to the answer. Uh, answer number one is that uh, if you have the ability to provide the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense better situational awareness because they can make better decisions, you should do that. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that with the legacy infrastructure. We can do that with a new infrastructure. And the second piece, and it sounds a little bit trite, but it's actually true, is that with today's technology, you really can't build uh, what we built in the 1960s. 
The information technology today is fundamentally different. If you try to go back and you can't build uh, eight inch floppy disk drives, you can't buy those things anymore. So you really don't have a choice. You have to modernize and you have to do it in a secure environment. But what you can do and what you can learn from the 60s is you can segment things off so that people can't get into it. There's no such thing as a fully closed network because there's always a human in the loop, but you can create as closed a system as possible to improve your cybersecurity. Okay. Um, one comment and then I have one additional question. Uh, my comment is uh, having, having been uh, watching these issues for a long time, I have seen the interests of the Department of, of Defense wax and wane in the uh, DOE's activities on, on the weapons. Uh, you know, General Selva, you were just talking about visiting the labs, about the Nuclear Weapons Council meeting and, and those other things. Uh, for what it's worth, I would just encourage both you and General Hyten to keep the attention on this issue. Uh, it is not a situation where you can say, oh, that's their job and I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, and you talked about the infrastructure and the other challenges that, that are facing in the in an SA mission. Uh, so for what it's worth, I just want to encourage you both to stay on top of this because when DOD does not stay on top of it, usually uh, we, we degrade our capability and, and it's not a good thing. And, and we've seen this up and down over the last 20 years. Uh, so I just mentioned that. Last question I would like to ask uh, each, each of you is just the state of our thinking on deterrence. Um, because there is concern that uh, after the fall of the Cold War, we decided we didn't really have to worry about strategic deterrence as much, that, yeah, we had China, but they weren't really a, uh, a threat, uh, and, and that we've put a lot of intellectual capital into counterterrorism and other problems, but, but these issues have been neglected and, and uh, we were talking about that a little bit with the Air Force, about the importance that, that was put on these. But, but talk about, if, if you will, your comfort level with the intellectual effort that is being put on what is deterrence and how do we know whether it's credible. And if something we think will deter Russia, do we automatically assume that will deter North Korea? Or is that a different kind of deterrence that we that is not a lesser included case? I'd, I'm just interested in y'all's perspectives on how much we have caught up in in our thinking about these problems. Sir, I won't say we've caught up. We are catching up. Um, the impact of the attacks on 9/11 on the focus of our intellectual capital going after CT, I would argue, right and appropriate. But where we we took our eye off of the strategic nuclear deterrence intellectual capital of the nation in a way that may not have been healthy. What I'm encouraged by, and this is why I say we're making progress but we're not there yet, is the number of young men and women who are pursuing degrees in both physics and political science that are now beginning to study the components of nuclear deterrence and, and debate and seek graduate and postgraduate degrees. I have a young man working for me now who got his PhD in political science and wrote about strategic stability in his dissertation. Those are the kinds of young men and women we're gonna to have to seek out, bring into the circle of policymakers so they can benefit from the experience of some of our more senior policymakers who have been doing this for decades and build that cadre of people that are gonna carry us into the future. Chairman, I'll, I think catching up is the proper characterization. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a good place catching up. Where we, I think we've caught up is that inside the military, we're having a robu very robust discussion now. We're talking about how do we integrate all of the plans between uh, the various combatant commanders, including Strategic Command with European Command and Pacific Command. We're having a robust discussion of, of what deterrence means in, in Russia and in China, in space. And, but, but where we haven't caught up yet, and if you if you remember when we were all younger, uh, when we were lieutenants uh, and ensigns in, in the Air Force and the Navy, there was a robust academic discussion of what deterrence really meant. There were books written. There was um, 
there was debate, even though we didn't have nearly as broad-based of a, a national media infrastructure, there was still this huge discussion in the academic community. That's just really starting back up right now. And in uh, Stratcom, we've now formed an academic alliance with 35 different universities and, and, uh, and think tanks uh, to basically try to re-energize that broader discussion because it is a national discussion. It's not just a military discussion. Well, I just think that's very important. And, and there have been some articles uh, written about whether you can analogize cyber deterrence with strategic nuclear deterrence. And, and I'm not making a, a, a point for or against that, but, but, but the key kind of skills about thinking about what will deter an adversary in whatever realm you're talking about is something I think we've neglected. And, and it, it is encouraging to me to hear you all think of that that's, that's getting going again and that, as you say, we are, are catching up. Um, thank you, each of you, for being here today. Uh, I think this has been helpful and, and we'll uh, thank you ahead of time for the further discussions we'll have this week and beyond. Hearing stands adjourned.